When most people think of Antarctica, they think of penguins, vast white plateaus, extreme unrelenting cold, mountains and crevasses, a remote place with great explorers but otherwise very little human history. Deception Island stands in contrast to this. First seen from a distance by Edward Bransfield in January 1820, it would have looked like any other island in the recently discovered South Shetland Islands. That is until 10 months later, when the American sealer Nathaniel Palmer sailed close to the island and discovered the narrow entrance into Port Foster. It is this unexpected natural harbour arising from the collapsed volcano that gives the island its name and provided ships with a refuge from Antarctic storms. Before long, British and American sealers were using Port Foster as a safe hunting base. The Antarctic fur seal's dense pelt was highly prized. But after the slaughter of around half a million fur seals, the population in the South Shetland Islands was virtually wiped out. No material remains from this era survive on deception. The next men to arrive would leave their mark on the landscape. In 1906, Norwegian expatriate Adolf Andresen took a factory ship and two fast whale catchers to the island. By 1908, there were three whaling companies using the bay, two Norwegian and one Chilean, which required 200 men, mostly Norwegian, to operate the ships. These early ships could process only the whale blubber by boiling out the oil in their open tanks. The carcasses, or scrots, of the whales were then cast adrift to float in the bay. The resulting stench, which attracted thousands of birds to the island to feed on the rotting carcasses, was mixed with the odour of rotten eggs from the sulphur emitted by the active volcano. It was a smell that belonged to the life of a whaler. Such waste was prohibited from 1912, following new regulations, and the Hector Whaling Company of Tonsberg in Norway established a land station at Whalers Bay to deal specifically with scrots. Whales were harpooned at sea and floated alongside the ships into Whalers Bay. They could then be winched up the slipway onto land to be flensed and dismembered there. The bone, meat and entrails were loaded into the 36 pressure cookers to extract as much oil as possible and the waste bones were crushed down for fertiliser. With the increasing number of operators at Deception Island, a small Norwegian prefabricated house and post office was erected for the British magistrate, and Deception Island became the first port of entry to Antarctica for all ships working in the area. The Hector whaling station operated until 1931, when a combination of recession and the invention of the factory ship Slipway put the land factory out of business. During these whaling years, a cemetery was established behind the land station, eventually containing 35 graves and a memorial to 10 men lost at sea. This was buried and partly washed into the bay when the volcano erupted in 1969. Only one empty coffin gradually reappeared, while two crosses have been moved there in later years. In 1928, an expedition led by Australian Sir Hubert Wilkins transported two Lockheed Vega aircraft to deception. Employing workers from the whaling station, Wilkins smoothed out an 800 metre S-shaped runway and made history by becoming the first person to fly an aeroplane in Antarctica. In 1943, a British naval expedition called Operation Tabarin was mounted to conduct scientific research and reinforce territorial claims in the Antarctic. The first of two bases was set up in Deception Island at Whalers Bay. On arrival, the team found that the magistrate's house and two of the whalers' dormitories were fit to live in, and they renamed the main building Bisco House. This base was known as Base B and continued to operate as a meteorological station and staging posts for ships and planes. The second base, set up further south at Port Lockroy on the Antarctic Peninsula, was known as Base A. This base still stands today and is cared for by the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust. In 1955, hunting aero surveys 
was contracted to undertake a major aerial survey of the Antarctic Peninsula using two Canso amphibious aircraft and two helicopters. They built the hunting lodge, now known as Fidesi Hut, after the Falkland Islands and Dependencies Aerial Survey Expedition. In December 1960, with the building of an aircraft hangar, Deception Island became the centre of British flight operations in Antarctica. The original Wilkins runway was improved and used for many years by single-engined otter planes. Deception Island continued as a safe haven for ships, stations and aircraft movements until December 1967, when, following two months of tremors, there was an eruption on the northwest of the volcanic island, which dropped ash in the vicinity of the Chilean base of Pendulum Cove. During a lull in the eruptions, the Chileans evacuated their base and made a dash for Whalers Bay. But no ship dared enter into Port Foster to rescue them. Small helicopters with brave pilots evacuated the 27 Chileans and eight British, two at a time, onto the Chilean vessel Piloto Pardo. Base B was reoccupied in the following summer, but only briefly, as a second, larger eruption destroyed most of the buildings at Whalers Bay and the remainder of the Chilean base. Once again, Piloto Pardo came to the rescue, and Whalers Bay has not been reoccupied since. Today, no one winters at deception, and only Spain and Argentina have active summer stations on the island. Deception Island's varied human history has been partially masked by nature, but is preserved in places. The Norwegian Hector Whaling Station is the most obvious, but some of the old British buildings can still be seen. And the roller for compacting Wilkins Runway is still there, near the aircraft hangar. The heritage in Whalers Bay is monitored in accordance with a management plan approved by the Antarctic Treaty System. Penguins and other seabirds can be seen on the island. The fur seals have returned. And the recovering populations of large whales now swim in the waters around the island.